Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Today we have a little bit of a different episode, uh, another one where it's just Aaron and I are going to chat about something uh, that Aaron is writing about, has written about, and also gives a lecture on. And it's something we've talked about with uh, Michael Humer and some other people on the show. Uh, today we're going to be talking about political obligation. Why should you obey the state? And I guess the first question I want to ask Aaron, since we're going to kind of do this like Aaron's the guest, but I'll, but I'll chime in occasionally. The first question I want to ask Aaron is, why does it matter? It seems, A, like some people may be listening to this who are libertarians would say, this is a really extreme topic. Uh, it's not something that is generally acceptable in polite company in Western political discourse uh, to even question the authority of the state. So it makes it seem at the very least weird and and also maybe, maybe extremists who shouldn't be listened to uh, pointing – someone could you know write a blog post about Cato and point to this podcast and be like, see, this is why you shouldn't listen to Cato on their tax policy because they actually seriously discuss the question of political obligation and whether you should obey the state. So why, why should we even have this conversation? Well, I think all of us have this conversation. I think this this isn't a question that's off the table for anyone because you hear people bring it up all the time. It's it's in the context of the government's doing this thing and it's not supposed to do that. It's not okay for it to do that. You know, what it just ordered us to do, the 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 travel ban, the first version of the travel ban was wrong. It's not okay for the government to do that and therefore I and anyone else don't have an obligation to obey it. You know, civil disobedience has a long history in this country. Um, we we all ask this question. We all have lines where we think if the government was to issue the following sort of command, I would not obey it, or in fact, be obligated not to obey it. Um, so, so discussing it is not the problem. I think where where people sometimes get a little bit worried is when you, you take it all the way back to the beginning. So you say – and that's why I think it's an important question to ask because if we're going to draw these lines, we're going to say here's where it's OK for the government to, to demand that I do X but if it demands Y, then it's not OK. It, it helps in those conversations to have a theory of well, how does it get to demand things of me in the first place? Is it OK for it to demand things? What are the parameters for that? What are my general obligations towards it at all? Because those are then going to inform the specific questions that are certainly not off the table and are certainly things that play out in conversations all the time. But we don't we don't seem to have the conversation in the general sense as part of our policy discussions, even though um, it is – a big part of modern political philosophy. I mean, in some way, you're not asking anything different than what John Locke asked, correct? Yeah, no, this has been an important question for quite a long time. I mean, we have all the way back to Plato's dialogue, the Credo, when Socrates has been condemned to death and his friends are trying to talk him out of it or trying to, you know, we can we can sneak you out of this prison and into exile. And he says no, and he offers a bunch of reasons why he has an obligation to abide by the command, in this case, to commit suicide of a court of his Athenian peers. And so he says, I have obligations to the state of Athens. Um, and so it's it's been a conversation since the very dawn of Western philosophy. Um, and it's it's an important one. I mean, we have we have this institution that we have granted enormous power over us that can do all sorts of things to us that we wouldn't allow anyone else to. It can exercise violence against us in a legitimate or permissible way that we would consider a criminal act if done by any other person or by another government. Um, we, we have an obligation as citizens to assess these powers, to understand where they come from, to understand what their limits are and understand what our relationship is to this institution. You kind of touched on it uh, a little bit just now, but um, what are the, the unique things about the state? And or, or maybe to put it a different way, what is weird about the state? Other than, that can do violence, but but also commands other things of us. Sure. So I think we start by saying, look, we have we clearly have moral obligations to other people, um, and and we can be 
in situations where our duty is to obey them in certain ways or to respect their commands or to not interfere with their interests that that you know this is this is just the nature of human morality and these things would exist without a state or with a state in any other form um so the the question then is the things that the state does that seem that would be impermissible if done by non-state actors what are those and why does it get to do those and so i think the things that make the state weird if you recognize the state is really the state is just at least other aberrant, people. at least aberrant yeah. compared to other things in society. But the state is obviously just made up of other people, and so these other people get to do things to us or or give us certain sorts of commands, and we have to obey them that other people wouldn't. And so I think that the things that set the state apart, set government apart, first is that it it can demand obedience from us in a way that other people can't or don't. Um, that it, it's allowed to issue us commands and then if we don't follow them, it gets to force us to follow them via violence or the threat of violence um, or punish us if we fail to comply in ways that, again, individuals can't. So you can issue me a command or my boss here at Cato can issue me a command, but if I refuse, he's not entitled to lock me up or take my property or shoot me, whereas the state can do those things. So that's that's one area where the state seems different. Um, another one is non-competition. So the state says, not only do I get to issue these commands and that you have a, a duty of obedience to me, but no one else has that authority over you. Um, and in fact, if if someone else tried to get that authority or you tried to set up an alternate authority, I could punish you. I could prevent it from happening. So I get, I get a monopoly on these powers over you. Um, and then the third one is taxation. And the, the state says, you need to give me a certain portion of your property and if you don't, I can punish you, um, and and an individual doesn't get to do something like that. You know, we can enter into contracts with people where we owe them money, sure, but they don't get to beat us up if we don't give it to them. Um, and and those contracts are limited in all sorts of ways that our relationship to taxation is not. So, a lot of people listening to this might think that. The answer to your questions or at least your skepticism is obvious, at least maybe as it concerns America, um, if you're American and, and maybe some other countries too, that the reason you have to pay your taxes is because the US Constitution was signed and ratified by the people of the United States and you are a citizen of the United States and that is why – the government has power over you or to put it in a different way, in a more general sense, that there is a social contract that we all consented to in order to enter into a state relationship and that has given the state legitimate power over us. It would be both Locke's theory, uh, Rousseau, Hobbes and to some extent actualized in the US Constitution. That seems to be pretty convincing or at least to most people. What's wrong with that theory? Well, so the consent theory, which is one of the, the major theories that gets given for justifying the state's authority, um, sounds convincing because in the abstract it is. We, we absolutely believe that obligations can arise from consenting to be bound to them. So if I sign a contract with you, then I have consented to be bound by the terms of that contract. If I make a promise to you, I've consented to be bound by that promise that I've done something morally wrong if I then violate the promise in your trust. The, so the question is not whether general notions of contract or consent work to give rise to obligations. The question becomes do they work to give rise to the sorts of obligations that the state claims, namely obedience and non-competition and taxation. So. Yes, there's a story you can tell of 
at one point we all lived in a pre-government world, a, a state of nature, um, and we had – call it – absolute freedom in a certain sense because there was no government telling us what to do. There was no laws we had to follow. But it was in in Hobbes' terms, our existence there was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, it was not fun. And so we decided to get together and we would give up a little bit of this freedom that we had in order to create this thing called government that would then protect our persons, protect our property, protect our other liberties and – in doing so, we would we would benefit our lives would be better, but we would agree to obey the laws that this institution created. We would agree not to rebel against it, so not compete with it, and we would agree to support it so that it could continue to operate, i.e., pay it taxes. And that sounds like a good story, um, but but it's got some obvious problems. You know, the the first is that. Um, I didn't sign any such thing. I've never lived in a state of nature. Neither have you. Um, we we never got when we became citizens of the United States. For both of us, it was through birth. We just happened to be born here. We weren't given the option. We weren't shown the terms of the contract. Um, so, on in a very literal sense, the story doesn't hold up. I mean, in terms of like explicitly signing this yes. contract, yes. or but what about people who became citizens? So the becoming citizens is an interesting case because that looks more like explicit consent. Um, the first, it certainly would not apply to most people in this country. Um, so that if if that's the way you have to do it, then the so government only they is, have to pay taxes. Then that would be only people who became citizens have to pay taxes. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I guess piecemeal. I'm okay with that, but yeah. um, that's not how things work. And the government certainly doesn't say, "Look, if you know, if you never got around to signing this thing, or you never had the chance, then sure, we'll we'll lay off and we won't command you and we won't try to tax you." Um, so the government steps outside of that limited range of authority. But also, there's there's an interesting thing about the becoming a citizen that your the social contract is not a contract. Um, so it doesn't have, you know, we both law school. Um, you know that contract law requires consideration. It requires both parties to to have obligations to each other um, and to give something up. If you look at the the oath that a new citizen takes, it's all about their obligations to the state. The state doesn't give a list of things that it will do. In return for them, um, so it's a, it's a loyalty oath. Well, isn't, as isn't there to, like protection and implied at least a police protection? I mean, maybe sure, not, maybe not like Medicare, or Medicaid. Maybe that's not explicit, but I think that at least cops and armies and sort of basic functions. Sure, there's an implied thing, but but the explicit terms. So if we're talking about like a, the instance where you actually have a contract in front of you and you sign it, which is the closest that you know is that becoming a citizen looks like the closest to that version of the social contract, the explicit social contract. It then that version doesn't look like a contract, um, like, like joining a healthcare a health club. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's it's there's, not like that. <laughs> there's also a problem. There's this. A, a line of Supreme Court cases um, that that seem to repudiate that notion of government. Um, I mean, I'll I'll toss it over. You can give us the facts. One of them, one that I talk about is Castle Rock v. Gonzalez, which I'll ask our real attorney. Yeah, that case uh, happened uh, not far from where I grew up, um, uh, uh, south of Denver, Colorado, when a woman who had a protection order against her bad ex-husband. Uh, for her protecting her three her three kids, uh, one of these sort of typical restraining orders that said, "If you come near me or you take take the kids, then then state law said that the police shall arrest uh, the the purse the the husband the ex husband upon him breaching this this restraining order." And so she went she, the husband went to pick up the girls from school. I believe is the way it worked, and he was driving them around all day calling her and saying very threatening things about what he was going to do to the three kids. I think it was three girls. And she kept going to the cops and saying, the state law says that you shall arrest, you you have to arrest my ex-husband upon him violating this restraining order, so do it. And the cops said, well, what, what do you think they'd say? They said, okay, well, 
we have other priorities. We'll we'll get around to it at at some point. Uh, they didn't. You know, they, she said, oh, he's over downtown Denver. He just called me and they're like, oh, you know, I'm sure he'll come back. I'm sure that he'll he'll bring the girls back. Well, the next uh, morning he showed up at the police department and committed suicide by cop, at which point they found the three girls dead in his car. She brought the case to the Supreme Court on the theory that the police had denied her police protection that had been – uh, commanded by the Colorado state legislator that they shall arrest him upon violating this restraining order. And she said, you've d denied me my life, liberty, or property, my property without due process of law and your obligation as police. And the Supreme Court held seven to two that the police have no obligation of that sort, um, more specifically that the legislator can't command the police to do things in a specific order or to put priorities in a specific way, uh, ma mainly the sort of famous conclusion that was written is that shell means may in this situation. So she didn't have – in some way, she didn't have the ability to enforce the law herself uh, if she would have gone and – dragged the guy back to the police department she could have been guilty of at the very least like the tort of false imprisonment um, or kidnapping uh, and the police didn't enforce the law either. So what happened with this obligation the state has to protect you? Right. So this looks like – so she – we can presume that she had more or less obeyed the laws most of her life, that she had not tried to set up competing governments um, and that she had paid her taxes. So it looks like she had fulfilled the terms of her side of the social contract and if the social contract were a genuine contract, the state would have obligations on its side too. Um, and at, you know, the, the government does all sorts of things but if nothing else, protecting your – you from violence is – I mean that's the story we give for social contracts the very beginning. Um, and so for the government to then say, well, no. You know, we don't we don't really have an obligation to do this most basic of functions that we exist for. Um, looks like repudiating the contract or saying it's not a contract in a meaningful sense in the first place, um, and and it certainly is not the case then that the government then responded. But okay, because we in this case absolutely failed to protect your rights um, and to protect the the welfare of your children, we're going to consider this thing null and void, right? Like, no, they, they still expect her to obey them and to pay them. Um, so, but they, but they owe the they owe it they owe police protection to everyone. I mean, that that would be the not. I mean, that's sort of the ruling of another case called Warren versus District of Columbia, which is a D.C. Court of Appeals case, that the police don't owe any specific person police protection, but they owe the people police protection. Doesn't that satisfy the contract? I don't see how, because the the government has is very specific that it's you that owe it these duties and obligations and taxes, um, and so if. You can't you can't get out of a contract by if you sign a contract with your um, with your health club to pay them fifty bucks a month for access to their services, but they routinely kick you out of that health club, or they routinely you know like you go in and they just go around turning off the various machines that you want to use, but let other people use them, and then you reply you say like well you you violated the terms of our contract. They're like no 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 we're our contract is you know to give access to a health club to the people in general, that's not going to fly. Um, so so the, the point is not that therefore there's no such thing as political obligations. It's that the specific case of it being a social contract doesn't look like it works for the government here. But, but I want to bring up that there's another way that we could get to this, which would be implicit consent um, that gets around the I didn't sign this thing. Angle. Um, yeah. And, so you, if you you stayed here, you, you live in the United States. You accept right. the services. You do all the stuff. So right. The heck. So the 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 analogy here is, you know, you walk into a restaurant um, and you sit down and you order food. You didn't you didn't sign a contract when you walked in saying, you know, in exchange for service, I will pay the bill. Um, but it's it's implied in your actions. Your actions indicate that you 
agreed to be bound by these terms, namely at the end of the meal, they'll bring a check and you need to pay it. Um, and so all of us, you know, if we, we live within this country, we use its services. Um, I rode the public transit in this morning. Um, and so are these the kinds of things that indicate a general acceptance of, of the terms of the contract? Um, and here again, the, I think the answer is unsurprisingly no. Um, and part of that is because in order to have these implicit actions indicate consent, there needs to have been a genuine choice in play. Like, you know, so if you were if you were forced at gunpoint to sit down at that restaurant table and order food, um, you wouldn't then say, you know, you okay, you've agreed to the terms of the contract because you didn't have you didn't have a meaningful choice. Um, so I have this David Hume in a in an essay he wrote on the called on the social contract. He he made this point about the implicit consent argument. He said, can we seriously say that a poor peasant or artisan has a free choice to leave his country when he knows no foreign language or manners and lives from day to day by the small wages which he acquires? So the point here is that it is really hard to leave your country. Um, in some cases, it's it's legally very hard to leave your country. Some some cases it's actually just illegal, like North Korea, for example. Yes, um, or or they they'll charge you an arm and a leg. They actually, I think it's something like sixteen hundred dollars to renounce your citizenship to the United States. Yes, yeah, so so those are those are instances. You know, there's those are state imposed barriers, but it's also the case like your country is the culture that you know. It's the language that you know. It's where your family is. Your friends are. Your um, your support networks. It's where you have been employed, where you've built up a career. So leaving it would be extremely costly. And whether that rises to the level of impossibility so that your choice to stay is not a meaningful choice may differ from person to person. Some of us have access to resources that would make it easier than others. But but we can't just say like, it's not as simple as saying, look, well, you chose to stay here, so therefore you're bound. But isn't the costliness of, of giving up these, leaving the country, giving up these social support networks, job, or things like that, isn't that just saying that the, the, the government, the state has provided you with a lot? And and that's why it's costly. So you, so you received a ton of benefits from the state. I think it would be hard to argue that most of the costliness is on account of state benefits. So my family is not a state benefit. My friends are not state benefits. My career is not a state benefit. Um, but all these, all these entities, Cato exists in a system of laws and um, is benefited by the property laws of the District of Columbia and by the utilities of the District of Columbia and your children benefit by the schools of, of Arlington and, and all of these things. Uh, so they're, they're mixed up with benefits of the state. Yes, but that's just an argument for how widespread the state's reach is. Um, it's, you know, they, the, a protection racket in a city could make a similar claim that, you know, we look, all the businesses are paying us this protection money. And because of that, you know, that we have a certain structure in place and you haven't been robbed. Um, and so you've now consented because you've been embedded in this system. Um, like saying that there is a system is not the same thing as saying that like every last piece of it is legitimate or has power. Um, although the that question of benefits does come up in one of the, the later theories, um, it's just not really related to explicitly consent. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to touch on one really – one last point on consent before we move on to the next one, which I think is important, which is if, if consent – consent is something – so I have consented to a set of terms, to a set of rules, right? And that are at least – like sufficiently knowable. Yes. I mean, maybe not every explicit rip. All contracts have plus, but at least you know somewhat knowable. Yes, here. and and that's how consent works in our everyday lives. You know, like you tell me, like, do you agree to do this? And I say yes. Um, but if say I make a promise to you to, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop by and 
feed your pets because you're out of town. Okay, and so I've consented to do that. And I now have an obligation to show up three times while you're out of town. Um, if I then show up and you're like, oh, and by the way, I also need you to mow my lawn um, and take out the trash and also run some errands. And I'm going to – I'm actually going to be out of town for an extra six weeks and need you to do all of that. Like you've – that's not what I agreed to, right? So when we agree to things contractually, there's a set of terms and there's a length of the agreement. Um, the agreement doesn't perpetuate forever. And if the terms change, like some some little bits of change might be acceptable, but but if it changes significantly, then we consider the agreement is now null, right? So the government changes the terms of the social contract all the time without my consent and often against my wishes. Um, and it seems to last forever, right? And there's no way for me to say, OK, I don't agree to that because that wasn't in the original agreement or I, you know, that was so long ago. Um, so that's another example of how this agreement we have with the state doesn't look like a contract. Before totally moving on from consent, I, I did want to spend more time because I think it's the most predominant theory. But I also – what about voting? So we, we talked about citizenship. We talked about becoming a citizen. Uh, we talked about the options available to you. But what if every time you vote in an election – is that sort of re-upping the justification of the government doing things to you? Voting would seem to give rise to consent in some instances. Um, if if we get together, if we friends, 10 of us get together, we're going to go out to dinner, we're trying to decide where to go and we say, well, let's put it to a vote and I want Chinese food um, and three of us end up voting for Chinese food but – six of the group ends up voting for Italian food, um, it would be at the very least kind of uncouth for me to then stamp my feet and say, well, I'm not going to go and throw a fit and go home. Um, that voting seems like a, a way to settle those kinds of differences in a legitimate way. Um, so the question is, does it the same sort of apply to the state? And I think the answer is no. Um, first, Many of us – well, first, there's a lot of people in this country who can't vote but are still bound by its laws, um, whether you know, a lot of the case felons have their right to vote stripped from them and we can't Children. just say, well, they committed a crime and therefore they don't have because it's – if nothing else, that's circular. Um, children. Children. Illegal immigrants. Yeah. Uh, but, but also many of us vote defensively. So we think that all the options are bad and wouldn't consent to any of them, but we, you know, we know we're going to suffer through one of them. So it might as well be the the least worst one. Um, but that doesn't seem like consenting. I mean, that would be you know the the mugger says your money or your life. Um, he's given you a choice and you vote on it. Um, that you haven't consented to the outcome, and. And then, of course, our vote – your vote doesn't really have any impact whatsoever. It's one among millions um, and so you didn't really – you didn't consent to the outcome because the outcome would have been the same whether you participated or not. Let's move on then to uh, some, one of the other uh, general theories of political obligation as, of course, philosophers have been talking about this for a while. So, so they have kind of itemized them out and – and, but I think a lot of our listeners and people who are objecting to this entire conversation are probably thinking about some of these. Uh, one of them is fair play, uh, which I think H.L. Hart did one of the versions of that. Um, but but you write it down in, in our little outline is if we benefit from a cooperative scheme, we need to abide by its rules or we're just free riding. And that I think a lot of people feel that too about why they should obey the government. What's, sure. what's wrong with so that? So the government if, – if the government is – just another word for the things we do together. Um, then we've all gotten together. We have, you know, sacrificed in certain ways. So as citizens, we've people have paid taxes. They've given up their time. Sometimes they've given up their lives defending the country. Um, it's it's a big cooperative enterprise. And if I have benefited from it, so I went to public schools. I you know was protected by police, so on, um, then 
I have an obligation to kind of repay or otherwise I'd be free riding. You know, so if, if the neighborhood gets together to have a potluck um, and everyone brings food but I don't and I show up and just eat food that everyone else brought, th there seems to be something wrong with doing that. Um, so it would be unfair of me to take advantage of the sacrifices of other people. Um, this is another one where clearly the, the concept of it can give rise to obligations but the question is, is does it give rise specifically to the kinds of obligations that the state asks for. Um, Robert Nozick had a an objection to this which was that in order for fair play to come into play, um, the, the benefits need to be accepted not merely received. So if the benefits are forced upon you or you never had a choice in accepting them in the first place, then we wouldn't say that you now have an obligation to repay them. You know, maybe, maybe like it would be a nice thing to do, but you certainly can't be forced to. Um, and and the government looks very much like that kind of setup. Um, so the the benefits that the government gives me, I didn't really have a choice about receiving. Um, I didn't have an option of a different police force. Um, I. In, in many cases, the, the services the government provides, not only does it provide them, but it, it monopolizes them. It doesn't allow other people to come in um, and, and provide alternative services. Um, so I'm, I'm embedded in this system. I'm embedded in this geographical area that is run by the state. And again, unless I, unless I can move out of it, um, I, I don't have a way to avoid these a lot of these services and a lot of these benefits. Would the same objection exist for occasionally you see these hit pieces on libertarians where they write something like Mr. Libertarian goes to his job at the Cato Institute and on the way he uses public roads and stop signs and stop lights and benefits from and Cato is protected by the public fire department. Uh, I think that we did have a, a fire alarm a few years ago and someone did tweet that it was funny that Cato was waiting for the fire department. Um, that seems to be kind of benefits that we receive. Is that is it the same objection apply to this, uh, to what you just said about is it we didn't accept them or, or are we accepting them by using them? So we, we've received them. Um, whether we accepted them would hinge on whether we had a choice about receiving them or a choice about using them at all. So the roads, you know, I – it would be quite difficult for me to get from my home in Northern Virginia to my office here at Cato in the District of Columbia without using state-provided means. Um, I – the, there's there's the metro and there's roads. Um, this I like could that, bike, that, but that would be sidewalks. This it's, sounds like that guy who built his own toaster. Yes. It would just be this like game. He'd be like, "All right, Aaron, like we like maybe some very extreme libertarians would try and figure out how to do this, but it might be impossible. It might be impossible, and I could I could telecommute, but even then, I would be using other infrastructure that was provided by the state. Um, so it's it's impossible to avoid it. Well, it seems to be related to one of the episodes we did on on a, a concept that I've termed the statrix because you have to think about how the state has made the alternatives not exist, at least insofar as competing – if you wanted to start a private road business um, or many, uh, many other private supply, supply like schools, things like this, you have to compete against the state which has – Privileges that you do not, as a private business, so you can they can subsidize. Uh, so it, as as a result of that, if those things do exist, there many of them are crowded out right. by the state. So right. then then you look around, you say, look at all the benefits of the state, and it's and it's also it's not just that there isn't a choice; is that the state made there be less choice on top of that. Yes, and a lot of these objections we're making now are quite similar if not the same to the objections to implicit consent theories. I, but there's there's another problem with the fair play thing which is if it does let's, – let's stipulate that it does give rise to obligations, that I do need to play fair, um, that this was a genuine cooperative scheme, that I did accept these benefits instead of merely receiving them. Um, 
that still leaves open the the question of okay, I've so now I have some sort of obligation to this this thing called the government. Um, well, there's or I have some sort of obligation. So there's there's two problems. The first is who are those obligations to? Because the people who sacrificed to give me all of these benefits were not the members of the government. They were my fellow citizens, my fellow taxpayers. Um, so it would seem that my obligation is to them, um, which would mean maybe the way to discharge that would be through paying for supporting government programs. Maybe it's also you know starting a business that employs lots of people or starting a private school that gives scholarships to poor children. Um, there are lots of ways that I could discharge that that aren't to the government. Um, and then second, those obligations – it's not clear that those obligations, that the way we repay them, the way that I repay the sacrifice my fellow Americans made in paying for roads, say, is by – Obedience, non-competition, and taxation. You know, maybe it's taxation. Maybe, maybe like I have to pay back. But, but why? You know, if at the potluck, my obligation is to pay is to bring food. It's not to obey the commands of the other people at the potluck and to agree to never set up my own potluck on the other side of town. Um, so, so again, the obligation – there may be obligations here, but the specific ones that the state demands don't seem to arise from fair play. Now, you have listed here a, a different uh, theory of political obligation, which is called gratitude. But is that much different than fair play? What it, is it that you, you should be grateful for all you have gained from the state? I mean, again, what, uh, this should pops in my head right now because – a lot of these things we're talking about uh, can be, should also be thought about in context of something like North Korea, just because like we're talking about general political obligation. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe one thing we should be talking about is it, it not right now. I mean, adding into the conversation, but more as a as a political in our political conversations is is a, you know if something sustains America's legitimacy, does it also sustain North Korea's legitimacy? Because you can make all these arguments about North Korea. You could say, oh, they get so much from the state and that they do get a few bags of rice and starving uh, thing. And then – so I'm listening here. I was like – And they don't tend to leave. And they don't tend to leave uh, and they probably don't want to leave because they don't know. Uh, so what sort of – is that – does that challenge the view of legitimacy? But yeah, so I, I was thinking about that when I read this line. We have all gained from the state. And I was like that sounds like something North Korea would – would tell you, uh, so you should be have gratitude to the great leader. But aside from going uh, in America, we have gained to some extent. Is this different than the fair play? So it's it's different than fair play in that it it attempts to get around the accepting receiving distinction and problem for fair play. So gratitude says, look, because you have used these things, whether you accepted them or merely received them, you should feel a sense of gratitude to those who provided them to you and then the sense of gratitude turns into an obligation to repay that debt. Um, so you know, if you, you're in a car accident, you're um, unconscious and someone comes by and hauls you out before the car burns, you should feel a sense of gratitude to that person even though you were in no position to accept or reject the help. Um, so that, that – it seems to have solved that problem with fair play. Um, but, but a lot of these same objections apply. So why would it give rise to the sorts of obligations that the state demands? So why would it give rise to obedience? You know, The person who helps you out of the car, maybe you, you have to – you should take them out to dinner, um, but you shouldn't. You know they can't just start issuing you commands that you then have an obligation to obey. Is that like Chewbacca's life debt? Yeah, so Chewbacca's life debt is a, a good example of you know Han Solo saves Chewbacca um, in some way. We'll find out in 2018, like I with guess, the Han Solo, with the Han movie, Solo yes. movie. But um, and so Chewbacca pledges to you know, be Han's companion and to help him out and protect him. Um, so that's, you know, it's a debt of gratitude that does Chewbacca's- he, he doesn't have a pledge to obey him, does he? I assume not. I'm not sure. It doesn't seem like obedience is a strong suit of Chewbacca. Chewbacca I agree. Um, but, you know, so the, I mean, this is, again, it's a theory like gratitude is a real thing and the obligations that arise from gratitude are a real thing. But just like fair play, the questions remain of even if you have a debt, are- 
obedience, non-competition, and taxation, the the way that you discharge that debt, uh, and also who do you owe that debt to? You know, do you, do you should you feel gratitude to the government agents, or should you feel gratitude to the your fellow citizens who supported this stuff? Um, and finally, like. There's there's the issue of you know we at the Cato Institute spend a lot of our time pointing out the ways that government makes things worse, um, and and if government especially is, has its non competition things, so it's keeping out what we would say are frequently better solutions that would be cheaper, more effective, less dangerous, so on and so forth. Then yes, we may have benefited, but overall we might be worse off now than if the government were smaller or different in some way or it were a different government entirely. So that starts to complicate the gratitude narrative. There's the great uh, Harry Brown quote, which is the government is good at one thing. It knows how to break your legs, hand you a crutch and then say, see, if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be able to walk, which seems to make that a, a problem. Now, Another uh, theory of why we owe things to the state is association, which maybe we've kind of touched on too a little bit, which which is the we're all Americans. Um, you're, this is a thing called America. You're part of it. It's an ongoing endeavor. Uh, so you need to obey American laws as part of this thing called America. Right. So this one, this one is. It's like all the others. You can analogize it to non-political -pol life and it seems to make sense. Like if you are part of your local church or synagogue, say, it may have rules or traditions and being a member of that organization means obeying those rules or respe and respecting those traditions. Um, so does, does the government work in a similar way? You know, you you're a member of a family and being a member of a family means having certain sorts of relationships to each other. Uh, per, you know, often you have to respect and obey your parents and so on. Uh, but the – so the question is, is the government that sort of thing? Um, and I think that no. I think that one of the problems with association is yes, we're, we're all Americans and there's something called America and we're part of this. But that's not the same thing as the Department of Justice, right? Like government is not America. Or the, the Raisin Administrative Committee, uh, which, yes. is, which is a New Deal agricultural program. The Raisin Administrative Committee is also not America. No. So the – so America would be America if the government was – had different rules or better rules or fewer of them. Um, so that it's – they're not the same thing. We can't, we can't conflate society and state. Um, but, but also there's some real concerns with the, the consequences of an associational account, which is namely if – if government is America, if obeying government is – if obeying the American government is part of what it means to be an American, then it's not clear where the limits are. Yeah, I'm hearing some North Korea in this uh, that some just extreme obedience – extreme yes. obedience is like required. You, if on a purely associational account, there would be no meaningful way to say that crosses the line, that no, the government – you know doesn't have the authority to do that because it's it's America and you know this is who you are and you obey it you know so it's that that's pretty scary from the North Korea example um it's also i think there's there's cause for concern because our our feelings of association can be misleading you know so the the government is very good at making us feel like it represents America it's like half they spend pretty much half their time telling us that I think. So they, you know, the the pageantry of it, the the symbolism of it, you know, there's it's not it's not a coincidence that the buildings throughout Washington DC look the way they do, look as imposing and the classical architecture. I mean, it's it's meant to make the government seem really important, really significant um, and part of a long tradition that is America. Um, and, and so we know that your feelings of association can be manipulated. Um, we know that they can be – you can have to, to 
to use a god awful term, false consciousness. Um, you can see it. So North Koreans, you know, who think that like clearly their government is illegitimate, um, but because it's a slave state. But a lot of them feel. I mean, they've effectively been brainwashed. You know, we see this with members of cults. You know, the cult leaders can be very good at convincing you that they have authority over you um, and that you are part of something bigger than yourself. And I'm not saying that the United States is a cult, um, but but just that the we should be willing to examine those feelings of association and willing to say, you know, how much of this is legitimate? How did I arrive at these feelings? Um, are am I being not manipulated, but you know, ha have I been influenced in certain ways? Um, Public schools, for example, sure. Yeah. So, Pledge of allegiances, things like this, and that. And I think the North Korea examples it, it bring it up again. It's good because I think it challenges people, as we said at the beginning of this episode, to to take these questions seriously. Because actually, the best argument against North Korea is not that it has. Bad policies. I mean, those are good arguments. It's, it's that it is a completely illegitimate criminal organization that is claiming authority that it does not have and oppressing people based on this claimed authority. And so, people would would analyze the legitimacy of North Korea's government in a similar way we're doing now. They would do. They would say, "Well, they consented," and they said, "Well, no, they never really had a choice." And it only matters if you meaningfully have a choice. So it's like, "Oh, well, they were born there." It's like, "Yeah, but they could. They couldn't have been born anywhere else. So they didn't become citizens. They 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 participated in the process somehow." And then they would say, "Well, you know, but they received benefits. Yeah, but they're brainwashed. They don't really have any choice." And so they would fully delegitimize North Korea. But then you get over to America, and you, do these same arguments apply? So I think it's a it's a good. It's a good foil for talking about these in a, in a good way. Yeah. Now, um, there's another possibility, which is the state is legitimate because it fulfills some other moral quality. So you, you have this listed as the natural duty argument. Um, it's just it's it's somehow moral by itself. So insofar as being moral, it takes your obligation because it more, things that are moral. Should receive your obligation, your obedience. Yeah. So, so we clearly have. There's morality outside of the state, outside of politics. Uh, that you know, we have we have moral obligations that exist simply by nature of us being humans who live in relationship with other humans. Um, and and so the the question here is, do those call them pre-existing moral obligations? Are they what gets us to the the authority of the state? Um, and there are various ways that we might argue for that. So one that I want to set aside really quickly because it it might it might look promising, but I think it's it's not quite on point. Is you know when the state says um, you shouldn't murder, there's a law against murder that you know you have an obligation to obey the state, and therefore. We've we've solved the obligation problem. Um, that no, because the the reason that you shouldn't murder is because you shouldn't murder, and the state has a law against murder, but that's not what makes murder wrong. And in fact, if the state had no law against murder, it would still be wrong. And if the state, for whatever reason, legalized murder, it would still be wrong. And so you would have an obligation to disobey the state. Yes, in that regard. Yes. So so that doesn't get us to. That's not quite political obligation um, and and quite a lot of the laws on the books are simply just statements of pre-existing moral obligations. Most of them certainly are not. Um, but but there's some other arguments that might be more promising. So one might be a utilitarian account. So utilitarianism, which we've talked about on the show before, uh, says you know the right thing to do, the morally proper thing to do in any when you have face a moral choice is to basically add up the consequences of the various options. So how much happiness or how much pleasure, how much utility will be created by your various options and then your obligation is to do whichever one of them creates the most utility. Uh, so if if having a state and having and obeying the state so maximizes utility, then that's your obligation is to is to obey it. You know, and so that would go back to our social contract. Like if you know, not having a state is really bad, the solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, then having one is 
morally good and we should support it. Um, I think one of the, the problems with that one is it's it would seem to say we should only support it when it maximizes utility. And there's a lot of reason to think that many, if not most of the things that governments do, do not in fact maximize utility, that we'd be better off if more people refused to obey those laws, refused to pay for those programs. Um, so it's it doesn't seem to get us to the kind of blanket obligation that states demand of us. Um, there's The other one is that we we have an obligation to obey just institutions. So this is – this argument goes that we, we have a – there's a pre-existing duty to behave justly um, and to support – That's just a moral duty. It's just a moral duty yeah. to, to behave. You know, I need to be just in my own life and in my dealings with others and I need to support justice out there in the world and support institutions that are seeking to promote or are promoting justice. Um, and and so if if the government is a just institution and is promoting justice, then I have an obligation to, at the very least, not interfere with it, um, but to also support it in that mission of promoting justice in the world. Um, this one, I think, has again a number of problems. Uh, one is that no government is perfectly just. Um, so they certainly wouldn't apply to North Korea and it wouldn't apply to a great many of the things the United States government does. Um, and so we get in a weird situation where should I only – do I only have an obligation to support those parts of – either those states or those parts of the state that are just, which maybe, but that's not, again, the blanket obligation. So, you know, that police and prosecutors and the DEA are pretty convinced that I have an obligation to comply with or support or not interfere with the war on drugs even though the war on drugs is monstrously unjust. Well, maybe it's just that when you said that no government is perfectly just and I think you could make an argument that yes, but they strive toward justice like we have a court system with error correction method methods that we acknowledge will produce unjust outcomes due to the very nature of human fallibility. Uh, but but it's trying. So you have a duty to support institutions that are at least attempting to achieve justice. Perhaps, but I think it would be it would be a stretch for a lot of the things that governments do to say that these are well meaning and genuine attempts to achieve Justice. Um, we could we could point to all sorts of things that the state does. I would go back to the war on drugs. is not a well-meaning attempt to support justice. Um, I think that we could we could agree that a lot of the things that our new administration has done and the the people who operate within it, um, many of them are not well-meaning advocates for justice. Um, so again, we we would have to pick and choose. Effectively, um, there, there's also the problem here that if our duty is to justice, it's not so. It's not to the it's not to the government, right? It's to you know the government is merely the means by which we happen to be promoting justice. Then it would seem that we would have an obligation then to promote justice in whatever means is a most is most effective, um, not simply to promote justice via the existing government. And so, in a situation like North Korea where the state is is everything but just, um, it would seem this would say you have an obligation to effectively rebel, to violate the non-competition, um, to try to establish actually just institutions. And we, we probably – we could accept that with North Korea like yes. Um, but, but then given that no state is perfectly just, um, including our own, it would mean that we would have an obligation to seek out alternatives if we can find them, if we can enable them, um, which again the state is going to deny us. It's going to say like, look, yes, you know, you can't, you can't like be supporting me, but at the same time be trying to establish a new regime that's going to be more just, a new set of institutions that are going to be more just, because that's that's rebellion. Well, it, it's it's odd because it almost uh, 
proper view of this argument, I think, would would have you um, trying to create just institutions, as you said, rebelling against some of them, but it definitely wouldn't have you just kowtowing to a monopoly on the use of force in a geographic area. Uh, it certainly doesn't get us to – it might get us to something where it's like, I obey this because it's just. And then if that's the only problem we have, then it doesn't it, – the fact that it's a state or not or it's called a state doesn't seem really to matter because it's just a just thing. So you should you should obey justice and follow justice. That's a good thing. We can call it the state or not, but your your obligations are to justice, as you said. Right. And, and your, then your obligations are to whatever institutions in whatever form with whatever labels are best or most efficient at promoting justice. Exactly. So – where does this get us? I mean, we talked about this at the beginning. We've gone through a lot of the classic arguments for political obligation, and I imagine that most of our listeners are probably not convinced about this still, uh, which I which I understand, or at least they practically think that it's it might be interesting in the abstract, but practically they're going to go obey the state. Yeah. Um, what where does this get us? What do we? What have we learned about how to approach both a political philosophy, and and but also be just looking at politics in our daily lives? Yeah. So I mean, one one answer to that, which is not mine, um, would be if the state, if we've now demonstrated that the state's authority is not justified, um, then we need to abolish it and have political anarchism, which would be the absence of a government. Um, that that would be the only way to you know if if enforcing its authority because it's not justified is immoral we need to stamp out immorality and therefore um, I am skeptical of that I'm not an outright political anarchist um, and and I feel that way because I think going back to the kind of utilitarian case or the social contract case that I'm I'm not convinced that. In terms of its just straight outcomes, political anarchism would actually be better for people in their everyday lives than some sort. I mean, right, at least right now. Right now, yes. Like, it, I think if we if we smash the state tomorrow, um, things would get pretty bad. So, and that that keeping things from getting pretty bad is another one of our obligations, another one of our moral duties. There can be conflicting things here, um, so we have to trade them off. It's not a perfect world. So in the, other words, it's like if we're going to bring about Mad Max and then maybe 200 years after that, we'll have a nicely organized anarchistic society, um, we might have to also make account for the fact that we put people through 200 years of Mad Max and the pain and suffering of that. Yes. Um, but so another possible thing is we could say like we might dispute that these are – that the arguments against each of these – five theories are quite as incisive as I made them out to be um, and say, no, I think these theories or at least some overlapping version of multiple of them gets us to something. Um, and I, I might grant that. But, but even if we grant it, it seems that they would at best get us to a very minimal state, that, that these accounts would get us to something that looks closer to Nozick's minimal state than it does to the expansive say, federal government that we have today, that most of what it does is not justified by any or all of these theories. Um, but, but I think the – all of those are like practical, like, you know, OK, so given this, what sort of world should we institute? But, but I think the really important thing to draw from this line of thinking is more of a, an approach to thinking about what government, what our government does going forward. Um, and this is to say that, look, if most of what the state is doing is not on strong moral grounds, um, can't quite – the powers it exercises can't quite be justified, be fully legitimate, then we should be at least skeptical of what it does. We should see it. We should not be – we shouldn't venerate it um, and hold it up as you know the highest achievement of – of the human mind that it's it's effectively a necessary evil but a necessary evil is still an evil even if only a little um, and we should be wary of that and so going forward 
We should be checking it at every instance. We should be shifting the burden so that when it claims a new power, we should say, why do you get to exercise that new power? What is the value in that new power? You know, like your a lot of your powers, I don't they're not as firmly grounded as you think they are. And so you need to have a really good reason why I'm willing to put up with and why we should all agree to a little bit more uh, authority exercised over us. Um, and then recognizing, I think the final step is if we recognize that at some level, you know, the state exists because we weren't good enough to live without one. Um, if we were all morally perfect, we wouldn't need it, right? Um, so if if it exists for that, then it's in part a failing of us that we need this thing. Um, and And so we should always be working to be better, and we should always be working to move the world in a direction where we need it less and less. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.